the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Good evening. So we're continuing our Bible study, and we're at Hebrews 6. So if you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews 6. So just to remind you, uh, the book of Hebrews was written to people that were Jews at one point, uh, became Christian, and for some reason or another, either because of the tribulations they're going through or because of the persecution, they want to go back to being Judaism. And, and this is what the, the book of Hebrew is written uh, for. It's that group of people. So here, he's the, the St. Paul is telling them that Christ is superior. First, he spoke about Christ superior than angels, then Christ superior than Moses, uh, and so on. And then this chapter and the next chapter... He's going to talk to them, and he's going to talk about the high priest, uh, Melchizedek. Uh, and, and we're going to go into more into the high priest, the high priesthood of Melchizedek next week. But let's focus on, on chapter 6. So here he's continuing the chain of thought that, you know, that you are young, uh, that you're, you should not be young in, in Christianity anymore. Now, by that time, you should be deeper in the faith. Uh, and this is what he kind of closed with last chapter, but he's going to build on that. So he starts out chapter 6. He tells them, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. So he's telling them that, you know, now let's put aside the elementary things. The things that you have been, uh, for, been for being a Christian for so many years, you should know these things by now because you're old in Christianity and you're not new. And then he's going to tell them what are these elementary principles. Okay? So he's telling them, leave the discussion of the elementary principle of Christ. So he's telling them, in other words, he's telling them to go deeper. Leave the elementary stuff. Don't keep talking about the elementary stuff, but go deeper. And, and, and he's going to mention now what are these elementary principles of Christ. It says, let us go on to perfection. And, and being, you know, going deeper in the faith and going towards perfection. And then he's saying, not laying again the foundation. So he's saying the, the, the principal stuff, the, the, the elementary stuff with the foundation. Not laying a lot aside the foundation, and now he's going to list them. What are the foundation of Christianity? He says repentance from dead works. Dead works meaning sin. Uh, sin that do not lead to life, but uh, acts that do not lead to life, but lead to sin. So he's, he's referring to them dead works, the things that lead to death. Okay, So he's saying from dead works, and of faith toward God. So now he's telling them to, to have faith. The foundation of stuff is repent, have faith towards God. So basically repenting and believing in God. And then the other principle that he's going of the doctrine of baptisms. So here, if you notice there, the, the S in the word, in the, the word baptism. And here he's talking to them is that you need to know about the baptisms. In other words, at that time, there was the baptism of John the Baptist, which is a baptism just for repentance, not for being born again. So here he's telling them that you should know these, doc these are the principal stuff, the doctrine of baptism, baptism of repentance, and, and the baptism of Christ, which is you're born again in him, and you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you read that in the book of Acts, there was a group of people that were encountered, and they were asked, were you, what, what baptism were you baptized? And then they told them, well, we're baptized in the baptism of John the Baptist. They said, no, now you need to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here he's telling them one of the preliminary things is the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on the hands. In the old days, and this is what we have as baptism and confirmation. In the old days, they did, they, you know, before having the, the, the Holy Spirit used to dwell by laying of the hands. The disciples would lay hands on people, and that's when the Holy Spirit uh, descends on them. Today in baptism, what we do is we baptize the person with water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He comes out a new creation, and then the Holy Spirit dwells on him when we anoint him with the oil of Myrun. Okay? Uh, but, but at that time, he's telling them, you know, the, the, the doctrine of baptisms, the laying of the hands, which is the Holy Spirit coming on them, of the resurrection of the dead, that telling them that, you know, we do believe that life after death and eternal judgment. We also, the stuff that element, elementary that we are to know of is that there's going to be one day where every human will be judged 
uh, and according to his deeds. Uh, like we say, according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our deeds. So, so these are elementary things. And then in verse 3, he says, and this we will do if God permits. So he's telling them that these are the things that we should be doing, uh, you know, God permitting that we should be living like that. And then he's going to talk to them about a group of people that were deep in the faith, but they sh their faith was shaken and left the faith. And he's going to talk to them about these people. And he's going to tell them that there's, there's a it's a very high chance that it's very hard for these people because of ego to come back into Christianity. And, and, and he's going to go into, you know, it's, he's telling them it's impossible. It's almost, it's almost impossible for people that grew in the church and tasted the, the, the love of God and tasted the Eucharist and did all this. And when they rebel against God, to some people, it's not theologically, by the way. There is a difference between theologically, anyone, no matter what you do, you repent and you confess, you come back, you're saved. You continue and, 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 and you're saved. The only thing is that when somebody does not repent, this is when the, the issue is, is that, that that's what he will be talking about. These people that do not repent and they're away. And they're saying is that, when, and, and let's read it and we'll go into, into it deeper. In verse 4, he starts talking to them and he says, For it is impossible. So, by the way, I wanted to clarify. It is not saying it's uh, theologically impossible. Practically, it's impossible. Practically, for these people, it's hard to come back. Theologically, Anyone that does whatever sin and repents on it, come through the door, Christ will accept him. But here he's telling them it's practically impossible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Enlightened meaning were, that's the, you know, the sacrament of baptism. It's called the sacrament of illumination. They're illuminated. Uh, it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, which is the communion. And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And here he's telling them it's impossible for these people that are deep in the faith. If they fall away, if they apostate, if they leave the faith, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. It's, so he's saying it's, re, it's almost impossible, the, uh, practically impossible, not theologically impossible. It says, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, but put him to, one, uh, to an open shame. So here he's saying that these people that leave the face after feel, tasting and the, the, the Eucharist and, 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 and accepting the word and being illuminated and so on, he's saying that these people, when they leave Christ, they are just denying him just like crucifying him again they're crucifying him like what the jews did the jews actually they saw him they they knew what the messiah is gonna do and all that but he was in front of them but they crucified him so here he's he's, re, he's comparing these people that they leave the after tasting all this good leaving the faith he's saying that he's comparing them to those who crucified again and put him to an open shame and this is not a surprise. And you'll see sometimes, for instance, when you look in the early church, Arius. Arius was a priest in the Alexandrian church. Uh, he was very eloquent in his speaking. He knew, he, was, he knew the faith very well. But he came out with a heresy. And when he came out with that heresy, uh, and he was excommunicated, he did not repent. He, he, it was very hard for him to accept what he did is wrong. And here he was, he was part of the, the, the clergy. But he apostate. He left the faith. And, 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 and here is a good example. Is a lot of times is that it's, not, it's practically impossible for someone that was deep in the faith and when they apostate for them to come back. Not theologically. Remember, we said theologically. If the, even Arius, if he would have repented, he would have been accepted. Judas Iscariot. If he would have repented, he would have been accepted. Peter did. Peter denied him three times. Judas sold him for 30 silver. So even Judas. So here, this is what I'm saying. It's theologically 
uh, is theologically possible, but practically because of the ego, it's impossible. And here, that's what he's telling them. For those who were deep in the faith, for them to, to come back. Verse 7, he goes on, it says, and he's going to give them an example. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bear, bears herbs useful for those to whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. So here he's giving them an example because they were mostly farmers. And they say is that, you know, you have a garden or, or whatever, a field, and you plant herbs in it. And whether it has weeds or whatever, that land accepts the water, just uh, the water in general. So here it says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated. And then he's going to talk to them that that same land that accepts the water, uh, part, of, part of that land brings forth fruits and part of it brings thistle and thorns and briars. And he's going to tell them what happens to the, to the blessings, to the fruitful land, and the land that brings up thorns and briar. And here it says, receives blessings from God, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected, and near being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And here he's talking to them about those who are apostate, and he's comparing them to those who accept the blessings, just like the land that accepts the water, but instead of bringing up forth fruits, it brings thorns and briar. And what happened to these things, the thorns and briars, what it happens is that they gather, are gathered, cursed, and is burned. And that's what, he, what uh, you know, he's, he's, he's resembling what would apostasy, uh, the, uh, the, the results of apostasy would be. And then verse 9, he goes on, it says, But beloved, now he's going to encourage them. He's going he's to set a bar for them, because really when, when you, you know, the words that you say encourages people and sets them up to that bar, and, and they work to that bar. And now that's what St. Paul is saying. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. So he's telling them that we expect good things from you. We are confident. He's not, he's not checking. No, no, I am sure that you can bring forth fruits, not briar, not, not, not thorns and briar. So, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So he's telling them that, yes, you, you, know, you, you, you can work hard and, and to receive your salvation in, you know, by accepting Christ and keeping in the faith and not being apostate. Verse 10, he tells them, and this is a very uh, comfortable verse for those who serve. Uh, and, and I always send, when I see somebody serving, I always send them this verse, Hebrews 6.10. It says, for God is not unjust, to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So here he's telling them that I know you, 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 you know, he's, he's sending it to the Hebrews. He's saying that I know that you serve hard and you know that I know that you labor hard and God is not unjust to forget all that hard work. He will remember every little thing to the extent that a cup of water that you give to one of his children, he will never forget. He says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name by ministering to the saints. By the way, when saints here is referred, is saints is the believers. The, you know, in the book of Acts, we are referred, you know, those who are part of the church are referred to as saints. So he's telling them that God will not forget I, you know, he's telling them, he's encouraging them. Remember, he's encouraging them. He's telling them that you work hard, you labor hard, and God is not, you know, he's not unjust to forget all these things. He's telling them that the stuff that you did, you know, like for instance, his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So in other words, the ongoing service. He's encouraging them. And he's telling them that you'll be rewarded for that. God is not unjust. And then verse 11, he says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. In other words, he's telling them that continue in that hope for the, for the eternal life to the end. Endure to the end. Don't let things of the world shake you. Tribulations, a trial or whatever. It says that have hope until the end. 
And tomorrow we'll talk about those who endure to the end. These are the ones that will be saved. Verse 12, he goes on, it says that you do not become sluggish. That's what happened when people uh, start, you know, straying away from the faith and stop reading their Bibles, st stop coming to church, uh, and start associating with the things of the world, and, and the world takes them away. They become sluggish. But he's telling them here, you know, this is St. Paul encouraging them. It says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And here he's talking to them, he's saying, remember the fathers that through faith and patience received the promises. And, and by the way, Hebrews 11 is the chapter of faith. And we will be covering that. And here he's going he's gonna to tell them ahead of time, but he's preparing them through faith and patience. People had promises, and when they endured, they got these promises. And then he's going to go to one of the examples that people uh, had faith, had patience, uh, and, and you'll, you'll hear many of them, by the way, in chapter 11, but he's going to focus on one of them, that through patience and through faith and not letting go of hope, uh, they endured, they inherited the promise. And here he's going to give them the example of Abraham. And you see it in, in verse 13. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, okay, and, and what was the promise? If you look at the promise, the, prom the promise to Abraham is that you'll have a child from Sarah and he will be fruitful and multiply and your children will be as much as the stars in, in heaven. That was the promise. And what happened is uh, Abraham endured through faith and hope, endured, and, and, and the promise was fulfilled. And then, but he's going to tell him something because here he wants to uh, confirm that that Christ is superior than anybody else is superior than the angels superior than Moses superior than Abraham and superior than anyone else so he says for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater in other words when God promised Abraham he swore and when God was swearing he says that there was nothing else that he could swear higher or bigger Okay, look that, look, look, with that with, keep, it, keep that in mind. It says that, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Because God, when he swore, you know, when you swear, not, you know, we're not supposed to swear, but when you swear, people usually swear with something bigger. You know, you're not going to swear with something small. you with something bigger. And here he's saying that with God, you know, he, he, he swore to Abraham the promise. He couldn't find anything greater and he swore by himself. And not only that, but he also guaranteed it by himself because he is all, he's God. Verse 14, it says, saying, and this is what God said, Surely blessings I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. This is the promise that he was given. And he was going to do that through child from Sarah. Surely blessings I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, Abraham, he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Was it, was, it, was it right early when he's young? No. Abraham was somewhere in the tune of 100 years old when he had, when he had uh, his son from Sarah. And, and, but the thing is, he endured, and when you endure, you obtain the promise. Okay? And this is the example that he's giving them. So then in verse 16, it says, For men indeed swear by the greater when you swear we swear always by a greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute you know when somebody is arguing and back and forth all they do is they take an oath believe you know they they, they swear whatever they believe and then and, and, oh, that was the end of the dispute thus god determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirming it by an oath. Immutability that it's unchangeable. So when God uh, did his oath, it's, it's, he, 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 he guaranteed it by himself because he's immutable uh, of his counsel, confirmed in by, by an oath. Then verse 18, it says that by two immutable things, uh, which is his promises and his oath, two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. There are some things that God is impossible to do. God cannot lie. Uh, that's, that's one of them that he said. He, for it's impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. 
And here he's telling them, make sure that your refuge and your consolation, it's going to be in the hope that is set before you. And always have hope. And this is the, the you know, he said that before. And then in verse 19, he, he also focuses on the word hope. It says, this hope is our anchor. That, 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 that Christ will come, then the judgment, and, and he will be, we will be saved. That is our anchor. This hope, we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. And, and this hope was in the risen Christ. That's what he's referring to. And he's telling them Christ is, 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 is a beyond every, you know, everybody, everyone else, angels or Moses, because the Jews at that time held angels to a big regard because they got the Old Testament through, through angels. Uh, and they got the Ten Commandments through Moses, so they held them. So here he's telling them that Christ is not just, uh, he, is, he is the one that went behind the veil. What does that mean? And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify it. It says, this hope, we have an anchor. So in other words, by the way, what an anchor does uh, is that when you have a boat and you, want, you don't want the boat to drift, you anchor it. So here he's telling them that you are, as a Christian, uh, you anchor. You put your anchor down where? In, in that hope of Christ. Uh, and, and because, by the way, these people were drifting away from the faith. And now he's telling them, no, 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 no. This hope that, that is set before us in Christ, he is, he is our refuge, and, and he is the one that we are to rest in it and, 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 and anchor in it. So we don't drift away from the faith. So this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. So in other words, it's trusted. Uh, and uh, steadfast, it's unchangeable. And which enters the presence behind the veil. So... In the Old Testament, when the, 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 the high priest comes in, the high priest is able to go into the Holy of Holies only once. Uh, once a year, and it's by lot, and it was very uh, scary experience for them, because, and they used to tie him with chains, because if they die inside, because of their sins or whatever, they, they were, they're not able to go pull him, so they pull him with the chains. So here he's telling them that, yeah, these, these high priests go in there, but we have that Savior that went behind the veil, the presence behind the veil. And he's talking about Jesus Christ right here. Where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, so he's, now he's clarifying it's Jesus, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We'll talk about Melchizedek because chapter 7 is all about Melchizedek. So here he's telling them that Christ that died on the cross was uh, buried for three days, uh, appeared 40 days to his disciples, and ascended into the heaven. He entered behind the veil. Behi because no one, no human was able to, to rise and go back into heaven except the the. the Christ, God, the Savior, who entered behind the veil. He went back into heaven. And this is what he's referring to, is that he's the only one, the only high priest. Uh, and he's going to comp compare, he's telling them about, about uh, he's going to talk to them about Melchizedek uh, and, and, and how Melchizedek is not after the priesthood of Aaron. And, and we'll go into more deeper uh, detail. But he's setting them up for that. So he's telling them that Christ is superior. He is the one that took our humanity, and introduced it into heaven, and, and, and basically God incarnate, uh, divine, and human entered into the veil of heaven. Anyone have any questions? Any questions? Let's pray. Make us worthy, O Lord, to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. To Christ Jesus our Lord. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Now the love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.